Uh, hello and welcome to our presentation this evening, The Westside Park Murders, Muncie's Most Notorious Cold Case, Virtual Author Talk with Keith Royston, presented by Muncie Public Library. Tonight, we will hear an introduction from Keith about his new book. I will ask him some interview questions and then we will have time to open up questions to our virtual audience. Before I introduce our visiting author, I do have a few housekeeping items to go over um, for those of you in attendance this evening. First, we are recording tonight's session. You are free to have your video on, but it would help to have your video turned off during the presentation if we have a large number of participants. For the time being, we have muted everyone. There will be time for questions at the end of our interview portion. If you wish to ask a question, you can use the chat box function. The button to access the chat box is located in the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. When using the chat box, please be sure that the to field is labeled to everyone. This way, all participants can see the question. If you want to ask your question verbally, we ask that you use the virtual raise hand function. This function is also available in your toolbar. Depending on which version of Zoom you have installed, the option may be under the participants button with an option to click the blue raise hand icon, or it may be available as an option under the reactions button. So now I would like to ask everyone to enter into the chat box that you can see our slide and that you can hear me. All right, great. Okay, so one person said they can't see a slide. Is everybody else seeing a slide? Yes. Okay. So depending on if you're using mobile, um, there may be an option to swipe to see the slide. Um, I'm not sure, but let's see here. See if you see a slide now. Okay, great. Um, so let's get started with some introductions. My name is Sarah McKinley, and I am the local history and genealogy supervisor of Muncie Public Library and manager of the Carnegie Library in downtown Muncie. My co-host tonight, who will be monitoring our chat, is Jared Brown, local history and genealogy specialist at Muncie Public Library's Carnegie branch. Our guest author tonight is Keith Roysden, Keith Roysden and Douglas Walker are longtime Muncie newspaper reporters who have written three true crime books together. The latest is The Westside Park Murders, Muncie's Most Notorious Cold Case. Roysden covered government and politics for most of his career, breaking news, including the FBI investigation into local corruption. Roysden and Walker wrote about the West Westside Park case several times, including an article that was an early part of their Cold Case Muncie series for the Star Press. That series reported on three dozen unsolved murders locally from the 1960s forward. Royston has won dozens of state and national journalism awards, most recently the Indiana Society of Professional Journalists First Place Award for Best Nonfiction Book of 2018, an award that he won with Walker for their second book. Since taking early retirement in 2019, Royston has maintained a freelance career writing news releases and carrying out public relations duties for clients, as well as writing nonfiction, pop culture articles, and two fiction books so far. Please join me in a virtual round of applause for Keith. So, Keith, for those who don't know the story, what were the Westside Park murders and what is this new book about? The uh, murders occurred in September, 1985. Um, the, the young couple who were killed in Westside Park, obviously, Ethan Dixon and Kimberly Dow. Ethan was just 16, Kimberly was just 15. And their bodies were discovered in Ethan's car uh, where they had been shot at some point uh, close to midnight on Saturday, September 28th, 1985. And what followed was 
probably the largest scale investigation by police ever locally that involved many officers, uh, many interviews, and so many uh, calls from the public with possible leads that uh, police uh, were near, very nearly overwhelmed and not specifically for West Side Park investigation. But soon after, Muncie police started using the uh, well-known Crime Stoppers uh, program to try to manage and be able to capitalize on um, uh, tips from the public. So the um, uh, the the crime is, is in a kind of a weird place in that police have a person of interest, but they have not been able to uh, get charges filed. So since that status dated from the earliest days of the investigation, um, there are many competing theories among police and among the public about what happened there. So Douglas Walker and I first wrote about the case in 1997. We did a few times after that. And uh, in 2010, we kind of informally kicked off our Cold Case Muncie series, which ended up being 34 articles over the course of the next eight, nine years, with an in-depth story about the Westside Park murders. At the time, we spoke to, as, as was standard, uh, friends, family members, police investigators. And we didn't really know at the time, but what happened was that the article, which prompted a lot of contacts from the public to us, prompted even more contacts from the public to the Muncie Police Department. So much so that within a couple of years, the Muncie Police Department, as had been its practice ever since 1985, had uh, asked a promising young investigator, in this case, Nathan Sloan, to spend as long as he needed reviewing the extensive number of files, the uh, many, many past interviews, and see if he could bring uh, a new perspective and possible new solution to the crime. And our book was kind of born out of that because over the years, we did updates for the newspaper. We stayed in contact with Nathan Sloan, who is now the chief of the Muncie Police Department. And by 2018, uh, Sloan felt confident enough of his uh, work that he managed to get through a court order a uh, subpoena for a DNA sample from a man who is actually already serving a life sentence for another murder. That act of going to court and pursuing something in an official manner kind of prompted us to in early 2019, began work on this book. And we spent about a year working on the book, many interviews, uh, reviewing many, many documents, old newspaper articles, and um, feel like we told the story in about as complete a manner as we possibly could with the cooperation of uh, Kimberly Dowell's father, who not only was interviewed, but also loaned his family photos to use in the book. And with the blessing of Muncie police, we, we, I think it's safe to say we would not have done the book if it could have possibly caused any harm. Mm -hmm. As it was, the book ends with uh, a, a suggestion by police chief Sloan that maybe this will prompt people to come forward whether that might take the case in an entirely different direction or whether it might already confirm what they think. So we include his comments and his email address in the book in the hopes that something might break as a result of this. Right, great. 
Um, so you talked about how uh, you had been writing the cold case um, articles, um, and then you and, and Doug sort of developed the idea to research and write about the West Side Park murders, sort of, at, because people were contacting you um, after those cold case articles. Is there something that interests or motivates you and Doug um, to have written the series on cold case files? You know, I think our backgrounds were such that we were the people of the newspaper who had the most contact with people in positions of authority, whether it be police investigators or prosecutors. And we knew, or at least were able to get a pretty good idea pretty quickly when they knew that um, uh, they had a, a promising lead. And of course, we basically tried to stay out of the way, not compromise what they were doing in any way, but also try to update readers um, about cases as, as there might be some even minute lead, at least in the case of Westside Park. With the other cold cases, we, uh, in these 34 stories that we did, we looked at uh, unsolved murders that went back to the 1960s. As I said, we found uh, at least 34 of those. There are probably more that we weren't able to come across. Sometimes we kind of, um, I don't want to say stumbled across them, but one thing that was, that was an advantage when we both worked at the newspaper Doug is still there, by the way, and an active reporter. And um, but one thing that that kind of a strange, quirky way we would decide how we might pursue a new cold case is the um, the newspaper's clip files, which were uh, literally um, uh, you know clipped articles in envelopes. We would look through the murder dash. Johnson Steve, for example, we would look through that section of files and find the thinnest files because the way the library was organized and traditionally had been at the newspaper was that um, coverage of su any subsequent trial of the defendant, the suspect in the case, would be included in that initial murder file. So when we went to the to the the, the stacks and stacks of, of files, which are all in the hands of all state now to be digitized and have been for several years, we found the thinnest files and we knew that probably there had never been an arrest. Uh, probably there had never uh, been a trial. Certainly, if there had not been an arrest, there wouldn't have been a trial. And that let us look at cases that had been overlooked for decades. Uh, had had almost been forgotten about, except for the few people, often family members, who would remember the person who was killed. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, so you talked a little bit about uh, your research process, looking through the newspaper archives. Um, is there anything else that you can tell us about what the research process was like for this particular book? Well, we knew to come, keep coming back to Nate Sloan because um, in 2014, we did an article, I think it was 2014, we did an article that was kind of updating what we had done in 2010. And sometime around that time, either in that article or, or one soon after that, Nate had had a couple of years to review case files and take calls from members of the public and also do interviews. He, he, in the 2010s, he conducted as thorough an investigation as if these killings had happened just weeks before, no less 25 years before. He interviewed people and re-interviewed people who had been spoken to at the time. And he talked to, uh, some of the original investigative officers just really beat the bushes to try to find as much as he could. So it, it helped us to uh, stay in contact with him. Now, one of those things about 
this relationship between authorities of any kind, including police investigators and newspaper reporters, is that they keep us surprised, but there are certain things that it would just be premature for us to write about. And the other thing, of course, is that they can't just, you see in the picture there, uh, I think a couple of, of ledger boxes of files. Mm -hmm. I mean, we never got the opportunity and, and shouldn't have really to like dive into those boxes. Um, that just wouldn't be proper for an investigation that Muncie Police Department absolutely considered still an open and active one. So between keeping in contact with him and sounding him out and getting calls from other people, it led us to write and sometime in the mid 2010s, an article saying police think their, their main person of interest might already be in prison for another crime. Mm -hmm. And that led to then more calls to them and more calls to us. So it's, it's really much a, a very much a cumulative thing in that um, it, it, I guess one way of describing it is if you ever went to the county fair and you played that game where you drop quarters in a thing and it would, they would fall in a pile of quarters and it would maybe push other quarters forward mm -hmm. so that you had a chance of collecting some of this change. I mean, that's how the police investigate things. They're just looking for that tip that will push everything forward. And that is how we were uh, pursuing that. And that we were looking for those little breaks, those little incremental nudges forward. Mm -hmm. So the subject of this case um, it's still a very sensitive topic for the community. Um, the trauma was sort of felt throughout Muncie and you talk in your book about how it was sort of the loss of innocence for the community. Um, did you actually live in Muncie in 1985? Um, and if so, what did you, I guess, r remember experiencing or thinking about the news yourself? Doug uh, had, had started at the newspaper. He came from the Anderson newspaper and he had started at the newspaper I'd say two to three years after these murders. I had started at the newspaper while well, I wrote freelance for them since I was in high school, but I started full time at, in 1984. So I was there at the time, but I wasn't covering anything like that. I was, uh, I, I was writing a lot of entertainment stories, a lot of general assignment type features. I think maybe by this point, I was also uh, the editor of obituaries that appeared in a paper. So I didn't really cover um, the, the initial crime, not in any way, shape or form, not even in the weeks that followed when um, there, was, there was some element of update to be had or something like that. There were a lot of reporters. And, and in 1985, there were two newspapers that were locally until 1996. So you certainly had a lot of eyes looking at it, but whatever happened that, and Doug and I started working together quite a bit uh, in about 1989 or 1990, whatever happened that kind of did that kind of quarters dropping cumulative push forward led to us doing the 1997 story. And that was the first time that Kimberly's stepfather had been interviewed and named in the newspaper. He had for 12 years at that point, 35 years now, because we spoke to him when we were working on the book. Mm -hmm. He had lived under this cloud of suspicion uh, for all those years. And he was willing to, acting through his attorney, to talk to us about what that was like, not only to maintain his innocence, but also to talk about the kind of pressure and and stigma that he felt. And when I talked to him in 2019, it was very much the same way. He, he felt like that, in, in that case, 34 years later, it had, it had overshadowed his life almost completely. Um, Kimberly's father, Dr. Anthony Dow, who had um, spoken to us for the 2010 story and did again for the book and loaned his family photos, 
Um, he had the kind of philosophical uh, attitude about this that I can't quite imagine being able to if, if I was in a position and had lost a child. Uh, his hope was that something good could come out of this horrible thing in the sense that it initially had brought the community together. Uh, he felt that, that people were more aware of each other and, and the ties that bring people together. Mm -hmm. So he, was, he played a big part in being able to do that story in 2010 and also in the book. And that when our second book came out, we had a book signing at uh, Menatrista. And it was, I think, in June of 2018. And Dr. Dow was the first person in line to get that book signed. And this is the second book. Mm -hmm. And like I said, he'd been very encouraging, very helpful in the article for the newspaper eight years earlier. And Doug and I kind of looked at each other and I asked him, now, how would you feel if we did something at greater length, maybe even book length about your daughter? And he said he would absolutely be happy to help us. He would, again, loan us family photos. That's where the photo that's so uh, striking of, of the two of them standing in front of the car. It was actually the week before uh, they were going to a Northside High School football game the week before the season had just begun. Uh, that's where that photo came from. And uh, that that level of interest and uh, cooperation and, and really compassion that, that the people involved in this have has really made this possible and also um, redoubled our interests in making sure that we did justice to the people involved. Mm -hmm. That's great. And I can't imagine being somebody who lost a child and I just have such admiration for somebody who, you know, hopes that that brings the community together, you know, hug your children closer and, and try to keep everybody safe. Um, so we talked a little bit about what was going on uh, when you were in Muncie in 1985 and Muncie has widely been considered the top, typical small American city and as you mentioned in the book, Muncie is also known sort of throughout pop culture. Um, do you know if the news of the Westside Park murders uh, gained much national attention or attention outside of the Muncie community? Well, we mentioned in the book that it was it was strange that um, the and this name may not mean a lot to a lot of people now, but the Weekly World News, which was a tabloid newspaper out of New York. Uh, that was more often writing about Elvis sightings and UFOs. Uh, they did a story about, and they, they had done stories out of Muncie a few times. One of them was uh, a strange one that some people might remember. There was a summer where there were, there were an incredible amount of uh, spider webs that were all over the city. They were all on people's cars and in doorways and things like that. And uh, the Weekly World News did a story about that. I think it was that tabloid, but they definitely did one about um, Westside Park. And that was probably the highest profile that um, it achieved in a strange way, in a, in a kind of a, a, a questionable publication. Mm -hmm. But there were certainly headlines around uh, the, the state and around the country. And just doing a, a standard Google search now, you see our stories are at the among the first Google results, but then you see articles from 1985 that other newspapers ran. I think it really hit a nerve with people mm -hmm. in that um, you know this was such a shocking thing and, and a thing that was so deeply felt by so many people. So yes, it definitely attracted some attention. Right. Yeah, it's hard to believe that something like that could happen in, you know, Middletown, USA. Um, and so I'm sure that a lot of people really sort of honed in on that. Um, so articles like the 
cold case series that you and Doug wrote for the Star Press have helped keep these unsolved cases and their victims from fading from public memory. Um, and I think you touched on this a little bit already, but have you seen or heard of situations in which police have received new leads or of cold cases being solved after they're brought into the public spotlight, whether that's happened here in Muncie or um, if you just have any stories that you've heard um, about those cases actually being solved after something like this is published? I think some of the more recent ones, in particular ones that, um, that Doug did, that were a natural outgrowth of what he wrote about as, as a police reporter at the, as the police reporter and courts reporter at the Star Press. I think those prompted some outpouring of, of tips and information to police. And I think those nudged those cases further. While Westside certainly uh, prompted, the coverage of Westside certainly prompted that, this is maybe a little perverse, but I liked writing about cases that were the some of the coldest of the cold that almost nobody else remembered. And uh, like there was a, a young lady, a young mother who was shot to death in, 19, six, in the 1960s while she sat in her living room and um, um, held one of her children. And that's not the kind of case, we did a cold case about her, but that's not the kind of case that's going to prompt much in the way of revelations 40, 50 years later. But I think it did, and I'm not you know, saying this is all our doing, but, but I think it did bring a little bit of satisfaction to her daughter who we found in the course of, of writing about that story. And um, I, I liked these obscure ones because if we could find members of the family, we could reassure them that not everyone had forgotten, mm -hmm. that somebody remembered. And um, that was satisfying, even if it didn't prompt a rush of calls to either us or to police. Right. So um, one of the uh, little things that you mentioned in your book uh, is the popularity of cold case and murder podcasts um, and shows which vary widely in how much these shows actually do their own research versus um, reading verbatim the work of journalists like yourself and Doug, um, sometimes without giving the authors credit, as you mentioned happened with um, somebody reading an article uh, that you and Doug had written. Um, I'm gonna mute everybody for just a second here. I'm around, I'm just- So we've got some background noise there. Okay, so if you can unmute yourself again, Keith. Sorry about that. Um, so do you think that these internet shows and podcasts have an effect on these investigations of unsolved crimes or that they have some sort of effect on the work of journalists who are um, doing their, their research? You know, it, it's pro it was probably kind of um, unnecessary of us to include that chapter where we talked about uh, cold cases as entertainment because even though treatment of, of cr writing about crime and treatment of stories about crime is, goes back to the Bible. And certainly in the past two, 300 years, there have been plenty of stories about true crime. Sometimes it's kind of easy to get wrapped up in the idea that, uh, and, and we see it occasionally in, in uh, television shows, streaming shows, and also hear it in podcasts when uh, it kind of crosses that fine line between writing about the uh, news event and crosses into the, um, the, the entertainment value in the, in the whole sense of, you know, podcast hosts advising their listeners to 
grab a bottle of wine and a couple of glasses and settle in and and marvel at at the strange twists and turns of the stories. But it's, I mean, really, it's only natural that there is some of that in um, true crime coverage because really it's a, it's a horrible thing, but crime is something that is um, kind of a, a, a commonality, a uniting thing among all of us. Almost all of us know someone who's been, if, they, if we haven't been ourselves, know someone who's been touched by crime. And um, it also lets us feel better about our own situations, not necessarily in a denigrating manner of the people who didn't fare so well, but almost kind of a relief and a release that um, this didn't happen to me, this didn't happen to my loved one. If we can balance that feeling of communicating that here's some news, here's some telling you some things that might not be news, but it might be telling you something you never knew before, even though it's waited for 35 or 50 years to come out. Um, if we can balance that with that kind of feeling of relief that you and your loved ones are not the ones who are the subject of this story. Um, I mean, that's the best we can do that we can kind of balance um, um, those two feelings. Mm -hmm. I always had sort of a, a theory that a lot of those shows also give people a sense of, um, especially the popularity of them during the pandemic, you know, I can't really control this thing going on around me, but here's something that, you know, maybe I'll notice something, maybe there's some way that I can help. Um, and I think that's one of the things that sort of draws people to these is that sense of, you know, why isn't this solved? What can I do? Maybe they haven't thought of this or something. Um, yeah, that's absolutely true. So um, there, you mentioned um, that the one of the suspects that was focused on um, was the stepfather of Kimberly. Um, another person who was a person of interest um, is the person who is currently still incarcerated for another murder. Um, and you actually contacted that suspect um, for comment, uh, but received no response. Do you think that this case may eventually be solved or that this book will give people a sense of closure, even if um, they never actually determine who um, committed the murders? Um, closure is a, a really strange thing and that I don't know if, if people who have experienced some kind of tragedy like this can ever feel complete closure. Uh, certainly some carrying forward of justice is a good thing and, and might go a long way toward a feeling of closure. One of the, the things that we wanted to do from early on was present a, a fairly balanced look at the different thought processes that went on uh, in this 35 years. That included talking to the police official from 1985 who was convinced that Kimberly's stepfather, and he still is. I, I spoke to him in 2019, and he's still convinced that Kimberly's stepfather was the killer, um, along with uh, things like the main person of interest that Muncie police have uh, focused on in recent years, who actually had been connected to the case really early on in a couple of strange ways. Or whether it was instances that uh, were personally fascinating to me that I never knew before. There were, there were articles in uh, the paper at the time about police contacting authorities in Concordia, Kansas, a city about the size of Muncie, about a couple of young people who were killed while parked 
there in that area um, a few years before Westside. And it's one of those things that, you know, their police are kind of catching something over here and catching something over there and maybe kind of putting them together and trying to figure out if there's a connection there. And at some point, only in the past few years were they able to make some connections in that there was a man, we talk about this in the book, there was a man who was arrested in Westside Park two nights after the teenagers were killed. And he was crying and upset and maybe intoxicated. And he, when they asked him, why are you here? And what's going on? And he said, oh, you know what it's about. You know what it's about. So they questioned him and they, you know, obviously they, they kept track of him, but they let him go. And many years later, in the 2010s, police spoke to that man's wife. And she noted that she and he had been in Kansas in the early 1980s. And they would drive around looking for houses to break into. Now, that put him not only at Westside Park two nights after the killings, but in Kansas in the early 1980s at the time uh, the, these two young people were killed near Concordia, Kansas. And in any other, I mean, if you're writing that as a, as a part of a screenplay, you might think that's that's too far fetched to include in my movie or my TV show. That decades later, police would be able to put two and two together. They take something from here, take something from there. Nevertheless, that person was not their strongest person of interest. So I feel pretty confident in that over the course of thirty five years, police really pursued every avenue they possibly could, they settled on somebody who um, uh, they believe is a strong person of interest, but they didn't forsake the idea that there were these other connections and other possibilities. And, and obviously you wouldn't want police to rule things out. You would want them to keep an open mind and try to pursue the things that, that um, were as promising as they could be until they could rule them out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I thought that was interesting, that connection with him. And didn't they call those the, I think it was called the Lover's Lane murders or something like that, where they thought that there was a pattern um, in the similar manner or um, situation. Um, so I would like to open the um, chat or um, if you'd like to um, ask a question verbally, if you'd like to raise your hand, um, we'd be happy to take questions from our audience for Keith tonight, uh, whether it's about um, the case or about the book or um, whatever you'd like to ask about it tonight. And when we, when our previous books came out, uh, sometimes when we would go talk to a Rotary Club or, or a local group, we'd get just as many questions about other cases or the newspaper business or something. So really, if you if you don't have anything you want to ask about this, but you want to ask about something else, you should absolutely feel free. Yes. And so the first two books for um, anybody who hasn't read them, it's Muncie, Murder, and Mayhem. And what was the other? The first one was Wicked Muncie. Wicked Muncie. And it's funny because History Press and, and the History Press books came about because in 2015, for the 150th anniversary of the city of Muncie, the newspaper did a huge special section of stories about the city's history. And um, Doug Walker did a story just touching on some of the crime over that 150 year period, notable cases. And someone at History Press saw that story and thought, hey, this guy can write 
probably a book for us. And they have categories. So they, so Wicked Muncie's title came because they have a whole Wicked category of books. Wicked is connected to New York. I got contacted by somebody a few years ago who was writing Wicked Columbus, Indiana. Hmm. Uh, so we always note to people, we didn't come up with the titles. Right. Same for, for same for Murder and Mayhem. But um, after they contacted Doug, he contacted me and, and said, you know, what do you think? You think we could work on a, a selection of stories? And we wrote uh, a couple of dozen chapters for that first book and a couple of dozen uh, um, for the second book. And then had the challenge with the third book, they wanted us to write uh, mostly about one case. And that was Westside. And um, so we knew we would have to branch off on other topics like Concordia, Kansas, or just for that matter, what Muncie was like in 1985 as compared to 35 years later, uh, you know, who the political players were, who a lot of the prominent police investigators and officials were. And um, so it's been kind of a strange uh, way of leading up to this, starting with uh, something about 150 years of history of crime locally, but it's the end result has been this these three books and this most recent. We do have um, one question from the chat. Um, how was the composite sketch of the suspect developed and was that used in 1985? And It was. It was released uh, just within a couple of weeks of the of the crime, and it appeared in the newspaper as well as a lengthy physical description of the person involved, and that kind of showed the different branches that police investigators were pursuing at the time, because a few people who were in the park that night described someone who the, the police were immediately uh, saying was likely to be Kimberly's stepfather. And then you had the person in his sketch who was identified or, or not identified, but, but it was drawn from their descriptions of somebody else they saw in the park that night, plainly not uh, her stepfather. So it showed very early on there were these kind of, and again, this is not a bad process. There were these kind of competing ideas of leads that could be pursued uh, by Muncie police. But that came out uh, within a week or two. I forget exactly when, but pretty close after the, the killings. And he was the one who was pulled over and gave a false last name of Dixon, right? Well, that's that's strange because this the sketch was identified. Of course, the sketch goes out and it doesn't have a name attached to it. Even if police believe that it, they know who, who this person is, uh, they don't put a name to it because they don't want to rule out anybody's uh, helpful information. So that sketch just kind of floated around for a while and it probably generated additional um, tips and comments to police. Um, but in 2019, when I was talking to Marvin Campbell, who was the deputy chief of the Muncie Police Department at the time, and I said, I asked him, Marvin, do you remember the, the, the sketch that was released while you were deputy chief? And he said, yeah. And, and he put a name to it, which was the name of the person who now is the department's uh, likeliest person of interest. Yet Marvin, lifetime in law enforcement, lifetime in, in investigations and interrogations of, of suspects and witnesses, still is not convinced it's the person portrayed there. He's convinced that it was the stepfather. Um, we have another question from the chat, uh, says, I may have missed it if you talked about it, um, but what about the fellow that rode railroad cars to different places and committed crimes, and was that looked into more? You mentioned how 
uh, close West Side Park was to the railroad. That was really fascinating to me. That's something that I had never heard before. And uh, it came up in those 2010s years of um, extensive investigation by uh, Nathan Sloan and other investigators from the Muncie Police Department. Someone close to the case came to him and said, have you heard of this Ramirez person who uh, carried out a crime spree from Texas to Illinois and Indiana? And um, he rode into town on, in a freight car and usually did not shoot people, although at the very some of the very first murders he committed uh, uh, he certainly did use a gun, but that kind of fell into that category of what if this is a much bigger case or what if it's part of a much bigger case? Because so many people theorized, well, I wonder if uh, this was a random serial killer who came through town and did this as opposed to someone who might have been here for all along, still might be here. Um, you know, what if it was this just random person? And that certainly has, um, again, it's maybe kind of perverse, but it's got a little bit of that appeal to it. And it's, and it's really intriguing to people. I think the, another thing that's really intriguing to people, but is a nightmare for police investigators over the 35 years was the idea that it could have been somebody who left town immediately or was just passing through town, not even necessarily in a rail car, who moved on. Uh, you know, they could be a world away by now. They could be on the other side of the country, the other side of the planet. They could have gone to prison for some other crime. Uh, they could have died from, you know, kind of your, your you know, totally non controversial, non-suspicious maladies. And we would never know here what their supposed relationship to this crime was. And in a lot of ways, that was like the worst case scenario for investigators in that it would really be unsolvable if this person came into town, however they came into town, just kept moving afterward. For them, it might have just been another incident. Uh, they never confessed to it. They never shared that information from anybody. Maybe they took it to the grave. Mm -hmm. um, another question from the chat. Were drugs or alcohol found in the car? And was Westside Park a popular spot for teen partying in 1985? Drugs and alcohol were not found in the car. And um, we write about the autopsy results. I think one of the teenagers had maybe had a little bit of Tylenol in their system. I can't remember which one now, but no drugs of any kind. And they did screenings for six or eight or 10 different kinds of drugs. So, um, so there was no um, question that that was cleared right away. Um, I think that, and we, we heard about a, a, little, a little about another popular hangout, which I wasn't really that familiar with, but uh, uh, a place called Indian Hill out by the Muncie uh, Prairie Creek Reservoir. But certainly West Side was a place like almost any place uh, that people hung out. And um, I mean, I was, I was older than um, them at that time, but a few years earlier, the, the small school that I went to, which was Cowan, if anybody's familiar with Cowan, I mean, we always complained that we didn't have anything to do. And we found something, and sometimes it wasn't always the best choices. Um, but the idea that people would go to a park and hang out was not over the reservoir or the parking lot at a, at a, a drive-in or, or a drive-in restaurant in that case, uh, was not unheard of whatsoever. Great. Um, another question here. The holster that was found in the car under Ethan's body, 
um, they say, I assume he died quickly, but did it appear that he tried to fight with his killer prior to being shot? I forget whose theory this was, but it, it wasn't, if it was from the time, it didn't really get talked about a lot at the time. There was a whole other topic sometime about what appeared in the newspaper and what didn't appear in the newspaper. But I think the theory was that, um, that the, if, if the killer reached to their belt, pulled out the gun, maybe the holster was still on it, they put the gun into the window, even if it was only slightly uh, through the window, and in the action of extending their arm, the holster came off the gun. The idea that it could be beneath Ethan if he recoiled, if, if and I'm talking about Ethan now, if if they were if he was moving around if he was reacting to something that that happened uh there are ways that 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 could have gotten under his under his legs certainly um but that is a possibility and a consternation for investigators from then until today in that in 2018, when Muncie police obtained a court order to get a DNA sample at the uh, Wabash Valley Correctional Facility, they hoped that it would in some way match uh, DNA that was found in the holster. That was really their only physical evidence that might have um, some connection to or been used by the killer. and. Over the course of 30, I guess it would have been 33 years at that time, there had just been enough breakdown and contamination, not, not even necessarily an a, a, um, a instance of negligence on anybody's part. But it's 33 years was a, it was a long shot anyway that some DNA might have been on that. And 33 years was enough to ensure that they just could not get a match with the um, DNA sample that they collected in 2018, November 2018. Mm -hmm. Okay. I don't see any more questions in the chat. Um, I do have uh, a couple of final questions. We'll see if anything else pops up, but um, thank you participants for your questions. Um, I do want to let people know that we have copies of the West Side Park book um, in the library catalog available for request. Um, but if participants would like to own a copy, where can they find a copy for purchase? I believe this still to be the case. I have not checked lately with any of these places, but obviously uh, we, we'd be happy if, if people bought their um, uh, their copies from local sellers. So that included the Orchard Shop in Entrista, the Mailroom on North Wheeling Avenue near Riggin, uh, the Muncie Map Company downtown, um, Aya Comics. Uh, they were one of the first ones that actually had copies and they had signed copies. Um, those might be long gone, but certainly Christy Blanche could tell you that. Um, Books a Million at the Mall, I, I, they've had our past books and we actually one year back in the before times, before pandemic, uh, we uh, did a signing there. So they've had copies in the past. Um, area Walgreens almost always seem to have copies. History Press does a really good job of getting the books they publish out there. And um, so while it's easy to get them through Amazon. Uh, my sister-in-law bought hers from Barnes and Noble online. If you don't like to deal with Amazon, I've seen them offered online through Target and Walmart, you know, places you wouldn't necessarily think that was the case. So the online resources are there, but the local ones are there and we really like people showing support for the local retailers. And I was, I was going to say, I did buy mine locally. I won't say which one because I don't want to play favorites, but um, if you get one locally, some of them are signed. So you can get a signed copy um, with Keith and Doug's signatures inside. 
Uh, we do have uh, one participant who has her hand raised, so I'm going to allow her to unmute to ask her question. So she should get a request. There we go. Hi, um, Keith, are you and Doug researching other cases, possibly more current cases to compile for another book writing? Um, you know, that's come up a couple of times since this book got finished. Um, I, maybe it's just because I'm, I'm retired and I'm, I'm working at a different pace now. <laughs> Uh, but that that this book was a lot. It was a lot to put together, and so I won't rule out ever doing another one. But Doug is still working, and that means you know twelve hour days, sometimes you know yeah. six days a week, sometimes seven days a week. He just covered the triple homicide uh, about a week or a week and a half ago here. Okay. So it's it's a lot to do, and I guess if um, if, if, um, um, everything kind of came together the right way, maybe there might be something else. Okay. I thoroughly enjoyed reading all three of the books and, Thank um, you. could relate to a lot of the, uh, participants in the book, your characters. And, uh, my sister's read it and my mother's getting ready to, I will send my copy for your autograph soon. I look forward to that. And I, I, Thank thanks you. for coming out tonight. Oh, sure. It was great. I enjoyed it. Yes, thank you, everyone. Um, oh, uh, one of our uh, chat uh, comments wants to let you know, Keith, that they enjoyed parts of the book that gave snippets of what life was like during the time that time in Muncie. Thank uh, you. That was that was fun because um, and I made I made good use of uh, library resources for that. And I think Sarah, at some point, a, a summer or two ago, we talked when I was there at Carnegie, because I was looking at um, city directories, which are this incredible resource that probably are no longer published. Uh, and if anybody's not familiar with what city directories are you could uh, look someone up either by their name, by their address, by their phone number. You would find out what their profession was and all that. And that day I used those because I was here and uh, I went there all the time, but I could not remember all the stories that were in Muncie Mall. So that was a really good resource for me for that chapter about what young people did in 1985 to be able to uh, do that research at Muncie Public Library, which I'm a huge fan of. <laughs> and um, as well, I am with Bracken Library also, just just great resources for uh, for Muncie people. But it was but it was interesting to do that research and kind of put myself back in that time for a brief period. We have a lot of great uh, history archives here in Muncie, keepers of the history. Um, and we had one question asking about which locations uh, have signed copies of the book. I know um, if they still have them, Aya oh yeah, Comics and Muncie Map Company, I know were two that you mentioned that had signed copies. Were there, were there any other places that had signed copies? I, no, I'm not sure if Muncie Map does. Aya oh yeah, oh. Comics does. Okay. Part of this weird hitch of, of, you know, this isolation that we're all in right now is that normally we would have uh, signed copies at virtually every location by this point. Um, but it's kind of hard to um, figure out the terms of how you do that when, number one, the, the books started really selling early at almost every location, signed or not signed. So there were plenty that were getting out there before we actually got a chance to sign. And then it was just kind of a, such a logistical thing. Uh, for us and especially for the people who were trying just trying to do business. I don't think any of them were willing to say, now, hang on a minute, we're not going to sell you a copy until like three weeks from now when we get it signed. Yeah. You know, they're not going to do that. So COVID has definitely made uh, everything challenging, <laughs> things that we never would have thought of. So hopefully we can all get together again soon and have a proper uh, book signing and get a little bit back to normal here. Um, 
one final question that I do have for you, Keith, uh, if you'd like to tell us what what's next for you and Doug, do you have any other books in the world? Um, we don't have another. I mean, the two of us don't have another book planned right now. Doug is is still uh, just constantly in it up to his neck as far as uh, stories that he's covering live every day. Uh, that the newspaper is as the first draft of history is really a, 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 a real thing. I've got, uh, in addition to being a um, spoiled retiree with more time on my hands, I've actually even got a lot going on and things I'm working on. So um, I, I think we have to figure out, it's one, it's one of those things that, that it, we didn't really ever start down this road we didn't think we were necessarily going to be doing books or anything so maybe it'll be very much a kind of a uh just a happenstance that that we end up doing something else something additional uh but right now we don't have anything firm planned well we've got three wonderful books um to look back on and i know that one of them actually came up recently a customer had a, a question for me about a murder that they'd heard about and I was like oh yeah I remember reading about that in one of Keith and Doug's books so that's actually come in in handy just in in my work so <laughs> um so thank you so much again Keith for being our guest this evening um and sharing your research and knowledge um about the West Side Park murders um thank you again to our participants um Oh, and one quick, one final question from the chat. If you'd like to say, uh, what titles of works have you published aside from the Muncie uh, nonfiction books that you've written? Um, I've published a number, in addition to doing some uh, news release work for, for uh, local groups, uh, I've published a number of, or had published, or, or caused to be published, a number of articles. Uh, in uh, in online magazines, um, and they're all very much pop culture articles. What I'm spending a lot of time on is writing some fiction, um, and not probably not surprisingly, what I'm writing is kind of about Muncie or a a city a lot like Muncie. One of them uh, is is all about my families' experiences coming to Muncie after World War II. But that's only kind of the jump, jumping off point. Um, I, I heavily fictionalized what they did, but I, I got to spend months doing research about Muncie in 1948 when the book is set. And that was, I love to do research anyway, but that was one of my favorite periods in the past two years. I just got to look at newspapers almost every day for a year long period. And I'm trying to find a, another excuse to just spend that much time doing research again. I'm, if I could do that, I will. Maybe I'll start with January 1st, 1949 and go forward. Well, you can always volunteer at the library. We we love having people. <laughs> I know. I used to drive everybody crazy. I would I would tell my wife or I would I would uh, send uh, screenshots to family members and say, "Look what happened in April of 1948." So newspapers are definitely an addictive source of uh, entertainment and and research and curiosity. So, thank you again. I do have one quick plug for our next um, program uh, that the local history and genealogy department is involved in. Um, it's Women's History Month. So our next program at the end of the month is Empowered, the History of Women's Suffrage in Muncie, a local history panel sponsored by the Muncie Delaware County League of Women Voters and presented by Ball State University Libraries, Delaware County Historical Society, Minatrista, and Muncie Public Library. This session will tell the story of the women and men who battled for the ballot, and you can learn about some of the individual suffragists and suffrage spots here in Muncie. Uh, you can visit the Muncie Public Library calendar, event calendar and click on the link in the description to register. And I'm going to share a link in the chat with a survey about tonight's program uh, that we would appreciate anybody who attended tonight to take a moment to fill out that survey. Um, thank you again, Keith and participants, and thank you. I hope everyone has a wonderful night. Thanks. Thank you very much.